And good morning and good afternoon, those joining us for session six, where we're going to be speaking about green metals, PGMs, and the global decarbonization. What we're really going to be talking about here is we're going to do an exploration role of PGMs, green metals, and rare earth in the energy transition, uncovering sourcing challenges, and fostering uh, secure supply chains with manufacturers, but also technological opportunities in the hydrogen economy. My name is Patricia, and I'm a business development manager at the St Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And I'd like to welcome all my panelists, who are Eugene Nell, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Vanadium Resource Limited, um, we have got Simon Quete, who is the African Mining Director of Paramount Tracks, and Andrew Rousseau from PwC. So as we start this uh, panel discussion, I'm going to ask each panelist to do a brief introduction from their side and just with some um, opening comments. But maybe before we kick off, um, let me talk a little bit about the JSC. The Johannesburg Stock Exchange is the 20th largest exchange globally and the largest on the African continent. So resources has for many years and is still part of our DNA and makes up about 30% of the overall JSC composition. Year to date, the, the basic resource sector alone has raised 6 billion rand. Um, and from a, J, from a JSC perspective, we are a leader in emerging markets. We do recognize the importance of integrated long-term perspective, perspectives into the financial market, reducing the social, economic, physical risks, and also to contribute to enhance financial stability, but more importantly, a low common economy, carbon economy. Um, South African listed mining companies um, have for many years been about amongst the best in terms of the ESG ratings in South Africa. If we look at their consistency alone in terms of the inclusion in the FTSE JSC RI indices, means that they've really stacked up amongst the best in the world. And of course, from an exchange perspective, the presence of ESG indices encourages companies to improve the disclosure and their efforts in um, explicitly considering broader ESG factors. And more so than ever, global investors are now looking at these issues and more intensely and, critically, and, and critically. So let me maybe go, let's start off with our panel, uh, maybe not with our panel discussion, but let's do some brief uh, introductions. If we can start off with Eugene, um, if you can just give us a brief overview and um, of uh, just some opening comments um, and an overview of your particular responsibilities and company, of course. Good morning, Patricia. Um, thank you very much. Um, just on me personally, I'm qualified as a metallurgical engineer, so I'm, I'm not a, a financial type of guy. I'm a hands-on engineering type of person. Um, I came through the ranks uh, on a various South African companies, both in operations and consulting. Um, since uh, last year, I've been appointed as uh, CEO of Nadium Resources. Vanadium Resources is an ASX listed company, but our primary project and our flagship project is the Steelport Drift uh, project, which is located in South Africa um, on the eastern limb of the Bushveld complex, with our main focus on producing high end uh, vanadium flake products um, uh, from, from the project. Um, where vanadium fits into the green metals industry, again, is it's a major component in the uh, bulk energy storage and uh, vanadium redox flow batteries, which we believe is a critical growth element and uh, a critical path going forward for the whole decarbonization and let's call it the green revolution move away from uh, fossil fuels. Um, as it is such a key element, uh, we believe there's, there's uh, major potential uh, with South Africa having three quarters of the world's vanadium, uh, which has basically been untapped uh, as to now. So we are working quite hard to, to progress our project and take it into the market. Thank you very much. Andres, over to you. Thanks, Thanks Patricia. Andres Rousseau, I'm PwC's uh, Africa Energy Utilities and Resources Leader, but my passion is really with the mining industry and what mining can deliver in terms of value to all its stakeholders. Um, and within that basket in mining, PGM certainly is, uh, is, is the, um, the ultimate passion. Um, so really looking forward to this morning's discussion. Um, the green economy needs mining to deliver and to resource the ability of green and renewable energy. 
And it's absolutely necessary that this industry supports that growth into a new environment. Thank you so much, Andres. And Simon, over to you. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, my name is Simon Quete. Uh, my background is, in fact, in the electrical engineering space, of which over the last 15 years I've specialized mostly in the control system space. However, what has really transitioned over the last uh, couple of years in my career um, within the electrical value chain has been more so in terms of what is it that we as corporates of Africa or Africa needed to be doing in the energy value chain within the African continent? So I have recently uh, joined Paramount Tracks and Equipment. Uh, the company is probably one of the uh, largest companies in South Africa servicing the African markets in the use of uh, all kinds of metals through our fabrication division. So with that being said, um, equally with my expertise in the energy value chain, um, we wanted to obviously ensure that going forward as an organization, we are equally part of the solution in the green economy. And how so can we equally be uh, fostering uh, our offering such that we are equally making use of uh, sustainable materials through our fabrications that we're putting out in the market. So I'm very excited about this conversation that we're going to be having as a team, and I look forward equally participating and sharing some of my uh, knowledge gained over my career and uh, in the industries we serve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Simon, and thank you very much, panelists, for those intros, and I'm also looking forward to the discussion. Um, Eugene, why don't we kick off? And um, let me ask you, do the underlying fundamentals support the global decarbonization drive, and can the targets and ideals of electrification drive be supported? This includes whether there is sufficient focus and investment being placed on securing the various metals required for this green transition, or whether the focus is currently misguided towards downstream manufacturing and consumer goods without taking into account the raw materials required. Thanks, Patricia. Um, yeah, it's this is one sort of topic or, or area that's that's been a I won't call it concern for me, but but something that we've picked up, um, you know, both in a regulatory and fun, and funding and financing uh, view. A lot of focus is being placed on all these downstream technologies. A lot of funds are flowing into the Teslas of the world and, and the batteries. Where I think there's a major deficit appearing. Um, in order to be able to build the Tesla vehicle or electrical vehicle, for example, there's a whole value chain ahead of it, all the way from exploration and mining to get the metals in place. Um, for that final decarbonization drive. But public opinion and public focus has been so largely placed on the downstream processing that I feel there's a deficit that's going to come along in the next couple of years where there's not enough metals and not enough funding to extract these metals to support these downstream processes. Um, there's a lot of focus also being placed on single metals in, and uh, there's not a, a good knowledge in the in the public space around the fact that there's more than just one metal required. Um, a good example is lithium. You know, lithium has been running crazy over the last couple of years because everybody picks up their, their iPhone and they see it's got a lithium ion battery and they believe lithium is the only metal required. But in the meantime, there's a major value chain right a, a front of that to supply the energy to support your your iPhone or your or your Tesla vehicle, and there's not enough focus being placed on there, which could lead to the whole decarbonization drive either being stalled to get these upfront metals and processes in place, or it could actually uh, result in consumers starting to kick against the whole decarbonization drive because it starts becoming too expensive. So yes, I do believe that there needs to be more regulatory and financial focus placed on, on the whole value chain. And then also we need to diversify this focus a little bit to realize that it's not just one or two metals required, it's actually a wide basket of metals required in, in this regulatory space or in this uh, production space. 
Thanks, Eugene. And, 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 and let me ask you, I mean, how do we, how do we improve that, that deficit from a funding perspective, particularly into, into, this, into the metals? It's, a lot of it has to do with marketing. Um, you know, as miners, we sometimes think we don't need to market. The, the metal will sell itself or the mining project will sell itself. And um, it needs a mind change from the mining environment and from the exploration environment to actually start entering the marketing space to market their metal, uh, to, uh, to get the message out there that guys, for example, us with vanadium, there's vanadium redox flow batteries are gonna form an integral part in this whole chain of decarbonization. It might not be in your vehicle in your home, and it might not be in the power or the, the solar plant, but you need to connect the two to each other. So you need a bulk energy storage in between. So we try to get, every time we do an investors conference or speak to investors, we try to make sure that we do this marketing drive on the metal itself as well, and not just our project. Um, it benefits the whole vanadium value chain or the whole vanadium industry not just ourselves, but our competitors as well, but we need to get that message out. And that applies to all other, all other metals and all other mining commodities. Marketing is gonna start playing a much, much bigger role in the mining industry than we realized before. Thanks for that, Eugene. And I think coming from the exchange, you know, we can we can say on on, on first hand the importance of marketing, particularly in, 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 in this particular topic and from this particular aspect, marketing to investors inherently there's a direct correlation in terms of investor appetite and the understanding and knowledge that they have for that particular commodity um, in particular and and the metal itself and the uses of it um, so so i think that's a very important part that you are making let me ask you one very last question eugene is that and then do you think that an integrated technology development approach is in place globally to address the full value chain of electrification um, economy from generation bulk storage uh, localized distribution methods and final consumer products i don't believe it is in place as yet but we do see there is a move towards it and um, if you really look back 10 years ago uh, when when the the electrification drive started showing the green roots and, and started coming out. Um, the whole industry and the whole community and the value chain was still falling around. You had the PGM guys, uh, Andres will know, they were pushing very hard for, for the, um, the PGM-based, hydrogen-based uh, electrical vehicles okay. as the only solution. And then you had the Tesla type, the lithium ion and the cobalt, and they thought this was the, the panacea, the, the, the silver bullet for everything. When in, in reality, um, the solution actually includes various components, various uh, strategies forward. Uh, hydrogen based uh, with the catalytic converters work very well with uh, bulk transport, uh, buses, trucks, and those type of things. The lithium ion type batteries and lithium ion products work very well with electrical vehicles. And then you've got like us with a vanadium re redox flow works very well with a bulk energy storage. So that integrated approach technically from, from industry, I think hasn't really settled in that we understand this is works well in that sphere and this works well in that sphere instead of trying to find one solution that solves everything. It is slowly starting to emerge um, that, that you see that people now understand that, look, we're not going to put hydrogen in, in a vehicle that's in your garage, but you might put hydrogen in a, in a bus. Uh, so they're moving away and the, the, the technologies are starting to integrate and starting to complement each other much better than it did previously. Um, it's going to take some time to settle. This is a new concept, essentially. You know, it, it's actually 10 years old. The oil-based and carbon-based uh, industries have been around for hundreds, hundreds of years. They've learned to settle and who fits in where. Um, but in time, both the markets and the industry will settle and it'll grow in that fashion. So it's early days. We're still uh, learning to walk, I think, as an electrified uh, industry. 
Well, hopefully we will uh, start running sometime soon. Um, Andres, let me let me um, ask you a question and um, focusing on, on PGMs in the new world. I mean, really the thorny part of decarbonization in the mining industry, it clearly involves a broader, tackling the broader value chain um, in terms of emissions it requires deep partnerships and an ecosystem mindset really to kind of get this going. I mean, in your view, um, how has the lack of uh, capital and investment in, and, and how has the lack of capital investment and exploration in the in general, uh, how will that impact the supply um, in terms of the new green economy? It, do you have any other comments to add to that? Yeah, I suppose as the accountant or auditor on the call, I, I should be quoting some numbers. Um, but the, the reality, and Eugene is absolutely right, that we just haven't invested enough in exploration, haven't invested enough in, in new mining. And therefore, we won't be able to supply in the long run the demand that, that will be coming through. There's, there's absolutely no doubt. If you look at the PGM space specifically in nominal terms, the capital investment there, and that's despite very nice high profits in the last uh, two years, um, is below the 2008 levels. If you look at that capital expenditure in, in real terms, looking at, at mining unit costs, then really that capitalization expenditure is below the 2003 levels. So you can see that we're absolutely nowhere. We've reached peak PGM supply out of our country, um, and that will continue dropping off going forward despite significant demand growth in the future. Um, I agree with Eugene that a big part of the problem is on marketing, and, and not even marketing metals, but marketing the mining industry as a whole. The reality is that those consumers that demand the green technology all see mining as very bad, very bad on the, um, the environment, bad on, um, on, on communities around them, and just shouldn't be happening. Mining needs to market their brand to demonstrate that they are actually providing the resources for the future. And those cell phones that we spoke about, um, they've got more than 20 metals in them, depending on what type and sort, and um, including the batteries. And, and that needs to be mined somewhere. It needs to be recycled as well. And I, I think that that's the one big focus area that we do see is that recycling will continue growing in the, in the future. And mining companies will start to play a role in that. Um, we, we see that locally with the likes of Sabanya, um, Northern get, getting into recycling. If we look at the, the global mining companies, then total revenue for the top 40 global mining companies, less than 3% of that comes from battery metals, green metals, and, and then that's really nickel and a bit of manganese in there with very little else. Um, so there's a desperate need for the big mining companies who's got the capital and who can invest in new mines in order to start investing in these green metals. And uh, you would have seen that the Sabania results released their new strategy on expanding that into battery metals, new acquisitions in nickel, lithium, which is quite an interesting play. Um, locally, I believe that we desperately need to see the beneficiation side of things. We cannot beneficiate without energy, but there is scope for us to look at the vanadiums, the, the PGMs, the manganese, the the cobalt that we've got from across our border um, and see how we can put all of that together and pick industrial zone and, and let's let's go and make use of, of that and start delivering into the world what, what we need to do. Uh, before the conversation, we said our Africa leapfrogged a lot of um, countries in terms of infrastructure and, and cell phones and the telecommunication. In the electricity space, I think there's real scope for us to leapfrog as well. I don't think we're in the space where we're going to see massive transmission lines crossing the continent. You'll have much more dispersed generation with renewables. And then Eugene's uh, vanadium, radox batteries or, or local localized hydrogen fuel cell um, to, to maintain electricity overnight when you don't have sun or the wind is not blowing. And we'll, we'll see much more of that. Um, it, it makes it much more manageable when you've got smaller electricity units. And I think Africa has got a real opportunity. We know this continent, more than 600 million people still need electricity. 
Africa has got a fantastic opportunity to start thinking new around electrification and how we do that for the people. Perhaps just an exploration, I didn't mention exploration. And, um, Africa's exploration budget is a little bit more than a billion dollars. Um, just north of or below 10%, depending on, on what year you look at of, of global exploration budgets. Yet all the, the metals that we need for the, the green future is, is on our continent. At the moment, the bulk of the exploration spend goes to Australia and, and goes to Canada because those are easy territories to mine in. But we, we won't be able to provide into the demand globally if we don't explore and extract on this continent. If we don't create the infrastructure in order to, to mine and extract here. Yeah. And the mining industry has got a huge role to play in providing on the one side um, the income for governments to generate the infrastructure. On the other side, to start um, driving infrastructure perhaps themselves in terms of, of getting things up and running. And we've seen that locally with the likes of Kumba supporting the Soldana um, railway line. So, so public uh, private partnerships to make infrastructure work for the industry, but giving the benefits then for the socioeconomic development around mining companies. Thanks, Andres. And, and, and seeing that you're on the floor, what is your view on hydrogen and how will this solve for the new world? I think hydrogen has got a fantastic future. It had a couple of false starts in the past, it has to be said. Um, but hydrogen is a fantastic uh, vector for transporting uh, energy. Um, and whether you do that in, in hydrogen pure form or whether you do it in ammonia as a derivative. Um, if you put the whole of Japan under solar panels, it won't be able to provide Japan with enough energy. Um, but you've got Australia down south that's got lots of solar opportunity and the how do you get the energy from Australia to Japan you cannot do it with transmission lines your losses is just too high so you you create renewable energy sources and create hydrogen from that renewable energy and you transfer it either as, as pure hydrogen as Japan is um, uh, trying to do or you put it in ammonia simply hydrogen and, and um, nitrogen, take it up um, with vessels, very similar to what we do with, with normal oil carriers. Um, on the other side, you extract it and you use it. So an excellent way of getting the renewable energy that we have in sun-rich, wind-rich countries across the world. In, in Africa, we've got fantastic opportunities in Southern Africa with South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, all excellent solar opportunities, but coupled to that wind as well. And, and that's the magic formula. If you've got wind energy and, and solar energy in the same place, your opportunity to generate percentage-wise at much more consistent levels does uh, reduce the cost base of creating origin by a massive amount. Um, so great opportunities here for us to create a massive new export opportunity. The demand forecast for hydrogen varies a lot, but the one thing everyone agrees on in the future is that they will be much more needed, much more um, used, and, and it creates just new opportunities. As Eugene said, we, we shouldn't be fixated on one technology or one metal or one solution. It's about harnessing the the old basket of opportunities that's out there to create a green future. Thank you for that. And like you say, you know, South Africa and Africa definitely has an abundant amount of, of, of resources, whether it's in physical commodities or whether it's in the sun and the wind, to do a whole lot. So it really does take a collective force to a multi-prone approach to kind of deliver the, 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 the outputs that we are really looking at um, achieving. Eugene, what is your view um, and, and can mining and minerals processing ever been done on a zero carbon footprint basis? Patricia, if you look at it and, and it ties into what Andre said around the, the reputation of mining as being a dirty industry and nobody wants to involve, be involved with mining because it is so dirty. Um, 
but then also tying in with what Andre said around uh, making use of solar in one area to produce hydrogen. So putting those two concepts together and you start thinking outside of the box around the whole mining value chain, mining and beneficiation, you realize that, yes, it is possible to move, maybe not to zero carbon, but to get pretty close to, to very low carbon levels once you start thinking outside of the box. And why I'm saying that is um, there's a lot of processes that generate heat. Uh, platinum smelters are an example. Chrome ferrochrome smelters are an example. With that heat, you can uh, produce hydrogen. So even though you are producing carbon in that process, uh, you're offsetting it by producing hydrogen for clean energy use lower down the line. That hydrogen can be reused in either producing electricity for your process itself. So you become a closed loop and a lower uh, dirty fuel consumer. That's one, one way that can be done. Um, the other option, what we are investigating on our project, uh, we are putting a, a solar plant up uh, to, to power our uh, beneficiation process. But at the same time, by just slightly increasing the footprint of our solar plant, we can then uh, uh, um, power up our fleet that transports our concentrate to our, uh, our refinery. So you've got a fleet of electrical trucks that uh, transports our concentrate 60 or 70 kilometers away. And on every return trip, they just recharge themselves from our solar plant on site. So there's a lot of novel ideas and thinking that can be brought in to bring mining much closer to zero carbon. But I don't, I don't think we're ever going to be truly hit zero carbon on mining. But if you then play it off against the downstream benefits of the metals that you are producing, and you look at the bigger picture, um, you are going to, you are going to come to a very low carbon footprint or very small carbon footprint. The only problem that we've got is a lot of the infrastructure in mining, um, it's long life infrastructure, it's high capital infrastructure. A refinery, a smelter, you know, you're talking about billions of dollars to put it up. It's got 30, 40 years, 50 years of life. So once you've got something that was built in the 60s, 70s, 80s, that's still operating, it does become costly to, to convert that into a low carbon carbon type process. So there needs to be some, both from, from the companies themselves, there needs to be a drive and, and an appetite to do it. And there needs to be some benefit for, for their shareholders to actually spend that money to become a greener operation. So in short, I, I think it's gonna be very difficult and it's gonna take time for mining to move that way. In 30 or 40 years, the newer mines coming out will be much less carbon footprint, but it's gonna take time and it's gonna take some effort to, to really convert to a zero carbon type footprint for mining. Um, and and it, it should be done. It should be done because that is what's expected of us. I think the reality is that cost pressures from electricity and carbon is, is going up by so much carbon taxes will start eating mining companies. Um, so the incentive to, to reduce the carbon footprint and to, to focus more on, on green and net zero is certainly there. I mean, our studies suggest that um, if you do for your transport solution, start investing in renewable energy, create hydrogen um, and, and fuel your, your truck fleet, um, whether it's long-term transport or, or online transport, very similar to what Anglo-American Platinum is doing now at Mokhala Kwena. Uh, that break-even point is very close from using diesel trucks. So the, the incentive is just there. You are going to be able to do it in a, in a much, cost, much more cost-effective basis. And then the one thing that we don't, or uh, uh, well, that we shouldn't forget, is the reliability of that supply when you do it yourself. We know we've got our ESCOM struggles at the moment around um, supply of electricity. If you can reduce the risk for unreliable electricity supply, it makes a massive difference in, in terms of the cost base. 
in, in our country, we've got lots of ref, um, diesel refineries that will be closing down in, in the next few years because they just won't be able to comply with new clean fuel regulations. Um, so what's going to happen, we're likely to be importing fuel in a, in a big way in the country. Again, we saw what COVID did to supply chains. If you're independent from a, a long supply chain to get fuel on, on site and have something locally that, that you have control over, it, it will make your life much easier in the future. Let me ask, um, in terms of doing a, looking at a zero carbon economy, I mean, I can imagine that, you know, certain countries globally perhaps are more advanced in terms of uh, further up in the value chain have done a lot more. How does South Africa and Africa stack up to global benchmarks? Yeah, I think the reality is that South Africa, although it's a big polluter, um, it's only about one and a half percent of, of global emissions. Um, if you take that to the rest of Africa, that one and a half percent doesn't grow by much. So all the, the reality is that we just don't have the level of emissions that Europe has because we haven't industrialized as uh, Europe, America, and China has. Um, our electricity supply in South Africa is still mainly um, coal driven and therefore emissions are high. We know Sassel is a big emitter in, in creating our fuel from, from coal. Um, but a, a, apart from that, we still need to build this continent and we can build it from scratch on, on right new metrics. Um, yes, and, and as Eugenia said, the old refinery, old technology that's in place, we are still using that. Now, unfortunately, ESCOM has closed so many of our smelters um, because of high costs and post the 2008 um, lockdown of, of blackouts and um, load shedding problems that um, we need to reopen them, but in all likelihood, we will have to reopen them with new technology, new smelters, new energy efficient ways. Otherwise, it, it just won't work from a cost-efficient point of view. And maybe just to add to Andres there, um, you know, new technology is not only going to be based on more energy efficient, but uh, a lot of the new technology out there and the new technology approach is to unlock the full value out of every rock that you take out of the ground. Mm. Um, you know, up to now, we've only been taking out the little portion of platinum that we want out of the material and throwing the rest of the material away. Where, in essence, every mineral that you take, take out contains platinum, nickel, cobalt, aluminium, silica. There's, there's a range of, of metals in every piece of ore that you, you mine. Um, in our ore body, we've got iron, titanium, aluminium, and vanadium. So all of the technologies that develop need to take, uh, take into consideration how can we access all of these minerals at once? Um, people risk their lives to mine that material. It, it's sacrilege to throw iron and, and titanium on a, on a waste dump because you only want the vanadium. Um, and the same principle applies to all other uh, ore bodies that's mined. So there needs to be a big technological drive to, to unlock the full value out of every piece of rock that you take out of the ground, because that's going to minimize the amount of energy per, uh, per individual metal that you produce. Yeah, I think chrome is a good example. I mean, the platinum miners got penalties for chrome in the concentrate in, in the earlier years. Um, now all of them extract the chrome and sell it for, for good prices, um, and similarly on the chrome mines. All the tailings are being processed for PGMs and, and it does um, add to the revenue base. We've got all companies set up on, on that. Um, and perhaps maybe that's a good segue for uh, Simon. Simon, where are the easiest and lowest cost, cost nodes for uh, market interventions to limit carbon emissions? And how should the interventions be designed? Well, to be quite honest, I don't think uh, there's any easier way to, in fact, uh, go about it. First of all, I think setting the right policy um, is where one needs to start off with. Uh, a policy that is obviously pro in supporting business initiatives and the economies as well, because um, by trying to obviously implement all the latest and greatest technology in reducing carbon emissions, 
we equally have the opportunity cost of how does it then impact the businesses. Um, that is one area of looking at it. The other one would then be uh, setting up uh, carbon taxes programs uh, that could equally incentivize companies that are largely in the uh, producing sector or that are operating within uh, uh, the uh, top line of the value chain uh, just to ensure that uh, these companies are equally either being penalized should they not be uh, fulfilling their mandates or they equally are being uh, given certain uh, taxes reductions uh, wherever they are optimally uh, producing. Third to it will then be um, the introduction of uh, mission vehicles, um, which I still believe uh, particularly in the African context, is not going to be an easy one to drive. South Africa and Morocco are probably um, first in line that we could see this implementation taking place. But as we begin to look uh, more within uh, other African nations, that is definitely going to be a massive challenge. And it is where such policies then tie up equally with governmental objectives in terms of how do we start gearing up for such. Uh, and I think as Andres mentioned previously, Africa has not been producing largely as the likes of China and some of the Western countries. So where we see the bulk of the actual emissions being produced on the African continent, particularly is mostly where vehicles are concerned. Uh, there's a huge, influx of old models of vehicles which are producing an enormous amount of CO2 um, and trying to align policies such that they could equally start perhaps even incentivize uh, motorists to start looking at converting their vehicles could be another way of looking at it. The next point I think that could equally be an easier note um, would have to be where the knowledge base is concerned. Uh, we have a larger population that doesn't fully understand greenhouse emission effects and carbonizations and rolling out programs such that we are continuously uh, communicating, continuously educating the masses, that will definitely be a plus. Um, many a times we operate within an ignorance of assuming that this particular issue doesn't affect us because we're not uh, residing on a continent that is largely producing, but in actual fact, this is a global problem. And by starting off in educating the masses and running programs, uh, even that can be introduced in elementary uh, learning stages all the way to post uh, high school and university, these are programs that I honestly believe will add a lot of value. And in the different organizations too, um, we, we could equally have a voice in uh, corporates where we could equally be engaging with uh, employees and staff, ensuring that they too are being educated such that we create a whole network of personnel that are becoming conscious uh, and are equally engaging and sharing knowledge. And very lastly, um, I would say another easier note could then be in terms of uh, town and regional planning where there's very little we can do with older buildings. However, we could equally start implementing uh, certain uh, changes such that uh, certain alterations are being made to buildings. Uh, we have seen this, in fact, in the central Johannesburg space, where some buildings are being converted, where now you have a lot of natural lighting that are protruding. And going forward with any newer development, it could be such that uh, architects and engineers are designing these uh, buildings and housing such that they equally too could be aiding in the reduction of uh, any use of uh, materials that are part of the uh, increase in the uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions we're seeing. Thanks for that, Simon. Let me ask you another question. Is there a possibility of large fossil fuel-free steel production amongst, amongst uh, current global steel demands? And can coking coal be replaced with hydrogen? 
That is actually a very interesting question. Uh, very recently, a company that uh, we've been dealing with for some time now has in fact uh, been given a license out of Sweden and have been stamped as a company that has in fact trialed out or deemed to be the very first company that has piloted a project um, where they are intending on producing the very first uh, carbon-free emission still by the introduction of uh, hydrogen as a fuel cell. Now, at the moment, green hydrogen, yes, is picking up. And I foresee that in a shorter future, by introducing uh, green hydrogen, we are propelling ourselves in a position where the use of mass still reproduction is definitely uh, approaching and is very close to us. So the answer is yes. Uh, are we getting there? Yes. However, the opportunity cost to it at the moment is obviously uh, the cost uh, in terms of uh, the ability of being able to produce green hydrogen uh, for the steel production. But uh, it is very exciting to see that uh, some companies have made stride. And it's a matter of obviously having to reduce the cost of rolling out this technology such that it is easily accessible to many more steel manufacturers or producers before we can see it in the general uh, industries. And I think there's this massive investment in that sense and, and the big miners are taking that on board. So Rio Tinto in, in joint venture, developing a similar green steel plant um, in, in Canada. Um, a company like Fortescue out of Australia investing more than $2 billion in generation of, of green hydrogen. So I, I think the miners are on board. They realize that there's incentive for them. It comes back to the marketing discussion we had up front. If you can sell a green copper, green steel, it, um, it, you might be able to get a bit of a premium for your product. And it won't just be a commodity, uh, which is something that we all striving for. So as an African context, you see where our copper is coming from, DRC, Zambia, Cobol from there as well. Um, and we've got the opportunity for massive hydroelectrical plants in the Enga setup um, that we will be able to process green copper by using hydroelectrical um, electricity. And um, so, so a huge scope for us to be focusing on that. I suppose the African context um, for copper Look at the grade of our ore. Um, it's more than double what they mine in Chile at the moment. So you um, you take out much less for the same final product. Um, it does give us a competitive advantage. So we just need to grasp and, and take forward. Great. Well, maybe um, off the back of that is uh, Eugene. Let me ask you: What are the main hurdles for small to mid cap companies? What uh, um, face in terms of securing the funding that they need from investor, from international investors in these multi-million dollar projects located on the African continent? Of course, funding is key. Uh, you spoke about you know, the needs of billions of dollars to put up a lot of these operations. What are the, what are the major hurdles um, that, that companies face? Patricia, I think I can, I can sum it up in, in a single word, and that's perception. Um, and the perception includes two, two sides of it. The one is the perception of the African continent. You know, the, the instability in West Africa, the east of the DRC, north of Mozambique, and even recently that we saw in South Africa, um, it doesn't create a good perception with investors. It creates a perception that it's, it's a difficult jurisdiction to work in. Um, interestingly enough, uh, after the, the unrest that we had in South Africa in June, if you compare that a year ago in the United States, they had the George Floyd unrests, which were of the same scale and about just as bad. But the reputational knock that the states took from it was much less than the reputational uh, knock that South Africa took from a similar event, for example. And that's because there's this perception being created that it's a very difficult jurisdiction and not a stable jurisdiction. For us that's in Africa, that come from Africa, that used to working here, um, we don't always understand why there's this bad perception around Africa. Because it's actually a great place to work in. It's, it's brilliant deposits to work with. Um, 
and it's difficult to change these perceptions of the international community where the bulk of, of the dollars lie. Um, and then the second part around perception is small tier and mid tier miners have not always covered themselves in glory, unfortunately. You know, there's been a lot of small tier mining guys that's come on the market, um, that's been fly by nighters and, and haven't done the technical work. They didn't have the technical capacity to make sure that the project fundamentals are in place. And investors have lost their money. It is high risk money. Um, but there hasn't been that technical support and the technical skills always under the, the small tier miners. So it's going to be a two tiered approach to actually get these funding and financing in place. And it's to change the perception around Africa as a whole, or the concept of Africa being a, a good jurisdiction. And is also starting to get smaller mid tier companies and projects that's successful and, and celebrating those success that we can change the perception that all small projects are are just profit seeking and, and going to take your money and run away. Um, so that that's my view. The biggest hurdle is perception. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you for that. And um, I came across there's a there's a, a, a 225 page report um, done by the International Energy um, Agency that said where it is possible to achieve a net zero emission by um, 2050. Um, of course, there is lots to do based on the panel discussion that we have here today. The global decarbonization is reliant on a multi-prone approach, you know, cross-sector solutions. We spoke about education. We spoke about marketing, the perceptions around Africa, and then, of course, using the tools such as carbon credits um, to achieve these objectives. So maybe just some closing thoughts from the panelists today as we wrap up this panel discussion. Maybe we can start off with uh, Simon. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, from our side, I honestly believe that it is achievable, that uh, we could have a uh, carbon uh, decarbonization effect uh, globally. Uh, in, in sense of business, I, I must fully agree equally with uh, Eugene. Perception definitely does play a massive role. And uh, as leaders in our respective industry, uh, being in a position where we could equally start coming up with ways of how we could change the perception. In many a times, your perception isn't your reality. Um, I'll spend a lot of the time out in the field in the respective countries, and there is a need. The people are definitely keen, but the sooner we could start bringing financial institutions together to bridge the gap, I definitely foresee this uh, being a plus. The DRC ultimately has come around. They're starting to turn and we can see massive investments going into the Inga project. So it is very exciting. And I think there's a level of maturity that uh, we are beginning to see equally in this space. So perception is a problem, yes. However, I also foresee that uh, we as a people are ready, and it's just a matter of continuing and remaining consistent um, as we uh, forge our way through the transition. Thank you. Andrews, closing thoughts? The renewable energy or green future provides phenomenal opportunities for um, our continent, Africa, or Southern Africa um, as well. It provides us opportunities in terms of our ability to generate energy and, and export that energy. We don't have oil, but we've, we've got renewable energy and we'll be able to export that um, via hydrogen. Um, it provides a phenomenal opportunity for the mining companies and the resources that we've got on this continent. We need to go out and explore for them. When last we explored, we were only exploring for very few metals. Um, and there's a whole basket of new metals out there that needs to be explored, need to be found, and need to be developed to deliver into the, the green future. If we don't mine them, we won't be able to um, have an energy transition as everyone is foreseeing and hoping to have. Um, we're often speaking about a just transition. I suspect we need to change that verbiage and come to a realistic transition because we're not mining enough and developing enough in mining in order to support the scale and the pace of the transition that everyone believes should be happening. 
Eugene? Yeah, Andre stole a bit of my thunder there because I, I also wanted to say that uh, decarbonization is actually a massive opportunity for Africa. Uh, firstly, because of the metals that we've got on the continent um, and the quality of the deposits that we've got on the continent. And secondly, you know, Africa is a clean slate infrastructure wise. Um, you know, we, if we look forward and we, we develop a, according to the decarbonization principles, we've got a clean slate to, to put things in place now. We're not tied to previous technologies. We're not tied to previous ways of doing things. And, and this creates a massive opportunity to actually leapfrog um, the West or the, the first world or, or other continents and, and put something in place that they have to change the way they're doing things. We haven't really rolled out electricity to our whole uh, continent yet. So let's roll it out in a way that it should be 20 years from now and not going backwards. Um, and that creates massive, massive opportunities for us. And it both hopefully from a, a financial um, institution viewpoint, as well as from a regulatory viewpoint, um, hopefully the countries will realize this and, and, folk, and place their focus on what do we want to look like by 2040, 2050. And let's put the building blocks in place now the exploration, uh, the technology, um, the way that we do things. And yes, it's exciting times. And it's going to be difficult for the old hands to change the way they think. But I think it's going to be very exciting to see how this pans out and how it develops. Great. So Andres, Eugene, Simon, thank you very much for your insights. Thank you for sharing all your wisdom with us. Um, that uh, brings a close to our panel discussion. So uh, thank you all very much.